Thanks to all of you guys for joining us today. Um, this is a topic that has become near and dear to my heart, uh, the study of color. So I hope that you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, I know from looking at those that are out in the audience that some of you are seasoned Shuma Luncheon learners, uh, but for <laughs> others of you, this is your probably your first exposure or very one of your early exposures to the rock art and to the Lower Pecos. So I think I'll start just by giving a brief intro to the region and to Pecos River style rock art before I dive into the important role of color in the life of the people and in the murals of the Lower Pecos. So the Lower Pecos Canyon lands, as we call it, are situated along the U.S.-Mexico border. They extend about 60 miles north and 90 miles south of the Rio Grande. We're not exactly sure on those boundaries yet, but we certainly at least 90 miles, miles south. It's a dramatic landscape, a beautiful landscape that's incised by deep and narrow canyons that contain hundreds of rock shelters. And within these rock shelters, uh, the archeologists have discovered a rich record of hunting and gathering lifeways that began somewhere around 13,000 years ago and endured until European contact. In 2021, the Lower Pecos Archaeological District was named a National okay. Historic Landmark. Yay! Uh, <laughs> this designation was awarded based on its outstanding contribution to history and culture. And most notably, it's the contribution made by the Pecos River style murals. Mm -hmm. um, these magnificent paintings were created by nomadic hunting and gathering peoples that lived in the region as far back as 5,500 years ago. That's the oldest date that we have for the rock art so far. The artists invested a lot of time and resources to produce these really complex murals that stretch oftentimes hundreds of feet in length and extend upwards well out of reach from the shelter floor. Almost all of the murals required some form of ladder or scaffolding to produce. This is really uh, driven home to us every time we go in the field to document the rock art, as you can see here in these three images. We now have, uh, thanks to a generous gift that we received, the ability to erect our own scaffolding to go in and do the work at sites like Panther Cave. Uh, this is me at the end of a 20 foot ladder and the rock art begins somewhere right around in here. And because Shumla is industrious and we don't always have ladders, we have a very uh, cooperative team that sometimes gets together to make sure that we can reach the, the places that we need to study as you see here. I was after dots on antler times in that photo. And although um, I will be mentioning our work at other sites in the region today, uh, I'll mostly be focused on my continued research at the White Shaman Mural, which is marked on the map here with the red circle. This site is owned and managed by the Whitney Museum in San Antonio. And if you're interested in doing a tour of the site, once the temperatures get back cool again, you can reach out to them for tours. Uh, I'll also be sharing tidbits of information that Phil Daring and I recently obtained when we visited the Huichol community of San Andres Cojamiate in Mexico. That was my last presentation, my last lunch and learn. I talked about the work that we did there and I've now completed transcriptions and translations and it's, it's very exciting what we're putting together. So when I first visited the White Shaman in 1989, I was working as a fine art painter and as a muralist. And it was through that lens and not that of an archeologist that I first saw the mural. And as an artist, I recognized the paintings as a planned composition. The mural spans about 24 feet long and 12 feet high. I recognized uh, the painter's use of such things as rhythm and movement and action. And I noticed too, their really skillful use of things like color harmony to create beautifully balanced arrangements of color masses in these compositions. However, at that time, back in 1989, the prevailing thought 
pretty much was that the Pecos River style murals were a random collection of images that were painted across hundreds or maybe even thousands of years. And recognizing that um, the profession may not be ready to accept my observations as an artist, I decided to return to university uh, to study under Harry Schaefer, who is with us here today, and obtain my PhD in archaeology. And the rest is history. And as you know, it's ultimately become my future. So almost 30 years after I first visited the Lower Pecos, I published a monograph in collaboration with Kim Cox about the White Shaman Mural. Uh, building on really decades of archaeological research, we demonstrate in the book that the mural is indeed a single composition. And using information from Mesoamerican ethnography and ethnohistory, we suggest that it's a visual narrative that, that tells a story about the birth of the sun and the beginning of time. Uh, this sacred story is still told today by indigenous peoples living in Texas and Mexico. And since the book's publication, I've made new discoveries about color that have really enriched my understanding of the art and the artists. Today, this is of course going to be my focus rather than on the iconographic interpretation of the narrative. For that, of course, I encourage you to read the book. What I've learned is that color in the ancient world engendered life. Images were made to exist. They were made to live by the symbolic power of color and an inherent life force that's in the paint ingredients. I've also learned that color was and really continues to be the language of the gods. Through color, the artists communicated with ancestral deities. And through color, the gods communicated with the people of the Lower Pecos. When we were down in Mexico uh, interviewing the Huichol shamans, this became very evident as almost every shaman that we refer talked to referred to the significance of color. Uh, this photograph is of a woman by the name of Alicia. She's not a shaman, but she is the maker of the jicaras, the gourd bowls that are the prayer bowls. And she said that the gourd bowls that have color that have been spread mm -hmm. with paint make the prayers visible to the gods. And those that are painted with red are seen by and made for the gods in the east and those in black are made for and seen by the gods in the west. So it, it, it was essential that they be painted with the pr proper colors, but it wasn't just that. Uh, Alicia also discussed the significance of the source of the color and all of the colors that she was using for the board bowls were uh, from mineral pigments. When I asked her if she could use something else, you know, maybe a Crayola or a marker to color the bowls with, she said, no, that would not work. It would not be effective. So the, the ingredient itself was important. So in the Lower Pecos, although we have a long way to go uh, in identifying the complete paint recipes used to produce the Pecos River style paintings, we do know that the pigments are inorganic. They're hematite, limonite, manganese, gypsum, and other types of minerals. And these inorganic minerals were combined with organic materials to make paint. What these organic materials are right now is unclear, but preliminary studies have suggested that the, uh, that the, the binder is likely uh, deer fat, probably that of bone marrow, and that the juice from the yucca plant, uh, also known as soap root, may have served as, a, as an emulsifier. It certainly has worked very well in um, all of my efforts to reproduce the paint. In the ethnographic literature, each of these ingredients is sacred and is used in uh, paint making. At Shumla, chemist Dr. Karen Steelman uses a process called plasma oxidation to extract organic materials from the paint for radiocarbon dating. 
The oldest radiocarbon assays that we've obtained for Pecos River style so far date to around 5,500 years ago, which is just incredibly exciting. And the youngest to as recent as 1,300 years ago. Now, this suggests that the murals were in continuous production for about 4,000 years. Uh, I don't mean one single mural produced over 4,000 years, but separate murals, that the production of murals uh, was in production for over 4,000 years. So just think about that a minute. The same artistic tradition, Pecos River style, in production for almost 4,000 years. The few legacy dates that we have for White Shaman Mural uh, place its production to around 400 BC. At Shimla, we've spent literally decades documenting, analyzing, and digitally reproducing this uh, really beautiful mural. And as part of our documentation, we created illustrations of each figure, such as the deer that you see here. And while doing this, we noticed what seemed to be a very unnatural painting sequence. The black dots, such as these within the body of a deer, appeared to be under the red. In fact, it looked like the black paint was always the first color that they applied to the wall. So we decided to study the mural's painting sequence using digital microscopy. Uh, here in the photograph to the right, you can see me holding the microscope. It's connected via a USB back to a laptop where uh, someone is actually taking the photographs and storing those photographs, the photomicrographs on the laptop. And on the left, you can see some of the photomicrographs. At the White Shaman, we examined 197 locations of intersecting paint layers. And what we discovered was startling. Not only did the artist paint the black dots first, but they painted all the black in the mural before applying any other color. And after applying black, they applied red, then yellow, and finally white. Through funding that we received from the National Endowment for the Humanities and support from a lot of you out there in the audience today, we've been able to analyze the painting sequence at 11 murals. We wanted to know if this unusual painting sequence extended to sites beyond the white shaman. And the preliminary results are quite intriguing. 99% of the locations examined followed this painting order. In other words, the painting sequence of Pecos River style rock art was rule governed. Now, put your attention to Panther Cave, for example, for anybody that's been to that site, it's huge, but it follows the same order. We've also determined that this rule was in place at the style's inception and endured for thousands of years throughout its production. So it's not just something that happened at one given time in that 4,000 year span, but appears to have endured throughout its production. So why? Why this rule? And why did nomadic forage, foragers invest so much time, labor, and effort in the production of the murals? Well, I believe that the artists were investing themselves in the very serious business of creation. Every choice they made reflects a reality in which everything, including the art, is animated and powerful. When Phil and I met with the Huichol shaman and elders in San Andres, there was no question in their minds that these images, the rock art of the Lower Pecos, are alive. In fact, their concern was that if we don't perform the correct ceremonies and provide the correct offerings, the paintings might die. The Huichol, like most indigenous people today, live in a world in which everything is alive and equally real. And everything, including art, possesses the power to make things happen. Images are animated, empowered, and vivified. Color not only made the characters in the art visible, 
that transformed them into living beings. Colors are associated with and contain the very essence of specific deities, natural phenomenon, gender, substances, souls, cardinal directions, and so forth. In Mesoamerican cultures, black is equated with such things as water, death, femininity, primordial darkness. And in contrast, red is equated with blood and life, fire, masculinity, day, and the crepuscular light of the sun on the horizon at dawn and sunset. Yellow is related to the sun and sunlight and the sun-drenched earth. And white is equated with the moon and the light at midday, sacrifice and transformation. Images were also made to exist by an inherent life force in the paint ingredients. The raw materials and still images with either the lightweight solar matter of organic colorants or the dark wet lunar matter of inorganic minerals. The artist's choice of an organic or an inorganic pigment was motivated for reasons beyond obtaining a specific color, not just trying to get red, because you can get red from organic or inorganic pigments. It was for instilling in the image either the hot luminous solar force of an organic material or the cold dark terrestrial force of inorganic substances, or perhaps both. In the Mesoamerican world, the universe is always regenerating itself by means of the interaction of these two complementary yet opposing forces. The animating power and meaning of color was not only determined by the raw material used in the paint, but how the materials were processed. So for example, the Aztec deities associated with fire were painted with red ochre. Inorganic materials from the earth though were not associated with heat, but with the cold forces of the underworld. Through or processing that ochre, however, the uh, Aztec artists instilled the essence of fire into the pigment. They exposed yellow ochre to extreme heat and a fire to transform it into red ochre. Thus, red ochre was considered a burnt substance and it was associated with fire. Lower Pecos artists used a similar process to obtain red, red pigment uh, used in the murals. And although red ochre is occurring naturally in the region, they extracted iron oxide from yellow siltstone, separated the iron rich components from the quartz matrix, and then heat treated the yellow iron rich powder to transform it into a red pigment. This is a very in lab intensive labor intensive process. Um, and this process infused the raw material with the essence of fire. This is some research that was done by Bu et al. And I have the, re the uh, reference I can give you at the end of the talk, if you'd like. Lower in, in, in my book on the white shaman mural, I interpreted the five black human-like figures with red heads as the primordial ancestors who carried fire through the underworld to fuel the first sunrise. In Huichol and Aztec myths, the five ancestors not only carried the fire that's shown here by the black objects with the red tips, uh, but were themselves considered fiery torches that were placed at each corner of the universe and, to, and at the center to sustain the sky and the newly born sun. For the artists of the mural, the torches and the torch bearers were not simply graphic representations of fire. The red paint contained the very essence of fire. They were themselves a flame. I should say they are a flame. Uh, in the view of the Huichol today, they are still a flame. As a side note, uh, when we met with the Huichol shamans, three of them independently identified these five figures as the candles that were placed at the four corners and center when the sun was born. That was pretty exciting. I suggest that the Lower Pecos artists, or perhaps more appropriately, we should refer to them as alchemists, uh, that they combine terrestrial and solar forces to produce meaningful art. They united minerals obtained from the earth, 
with organic ingredients obtained from plants and animals to produce vivid and vivified colors, colors that engendered life. Each layer of paint in the mural represents a layer of human behavior, a layer of choice and of meaning. The artist began with black, the color of femininity, the watery underworld and primordial time, a time of perpetual darkness broken only by the cool light of the stars. When I asked uh, shamans Tomasita and Estela why Lower Pecos artists painted the black first, they responded very matter-of-factly that it was because the sun had not yet been born. Huh. Huh. After the black paint dried, the artist applied red, the color associated with masculinity, fire, and blood. It's also the color of the fiery red glow appearing on the horizon just before sunrise. According to sacred stories, the union of red and black masculine and feminine, fire and matter, initiated creation and gave birth to the sun. Huichol Shaman Servando told us that red is associated with the light of pre-dawn and that it's followed by yellow, the color of the sun. And sure enough, the next color applied to the wall was yellow, the color associated with the rays of the morning sun as it warms the earth and overcomes the cold black of night and the red of pre-dawn. And finally, the artist applied white. According again to Servando, this is the color associated with the zenith and the bright light of midday. It's the light that renders all of creation shadowless. It's the color of sacrificial transformation and transcendence. Moving from darkness to light, Artists participated in divine creation. They instilled cycles of time and meaning into the mural through their choice in materials and color and the paint application order. And from there, the master painter, the sun, takes over and completes the cycle, moving us from light to darkness. Recently, as I was reviewing uh, time-lapse photographs taken on the winter solstice at the White Shaman site, I noticed something stunning. The sun reverses the color order applied by the muralist as it sets, sets in the west. Using the language of the gods, the sun paints the wall white, then yellow, then red, and ultimately, as the sun sets into the underworld, we're to return to the blackness of primor primordial time. Color is the language of the gods. Like the rhythm of a beating heart, motion and life are instilled in the mural through this color dialogue between the artist and the solar deity. From a Western perspective, rock art panels like the White Shaman Mural are viewed as a, collect as a collection of just lifeless signs and symbols. The rock art of the Lower Pecos, however, really challenges that perception and proposes a reality in which the artists imbued images with life through color and the deliberate selection and processing of raw materials and their manner of execution. The paintings were not merely decorative, they weren't just instructional, and they're not just records of past events. They were and continue to be powerful, sentient beings that possess their own point of view and intentionality. But let there be no mistake, the concepts that I presented here are not just things of the past. They are alive and well in the indigenous world today. Images are still made to exist by the symbolic power of color and the inherent life force and paint ingredients. Color, the language of the gods, engenders life, past, present, and future. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Carolyn.